Hi everybody, Greg Harrell here, uh, and VimConf has just come to a close. Uh, so I wanted to just record some thoughts to it uh, in response uh, while it's still fresh in my mind. The uh, videos aren't uploaded yet. I guess I'll be uploaded in the next day or two. Uh, but what I have here is a, a great agenda, which uh, one of the people who was uh, attended, I don't even actually know who this person is, to be honest. Maybe I should. <laughs> who did this? Sven. He's a Vim user. Great job on uh, documenting this stuff and providing links to people's talks and slides and accounts and whatnot. Um, so I guess, first of all, uh, one thing to note is because this was a two track conference, I didn't actually get to see everything. There might be some things that I go back and look at later. Um, so I'm gonna comment on a couple of things that I saw that I enjoyed and that uh, when the videos are available, I'll put a link to them in the notes for this video. Um, so you can check it out. Um, but uh, looking at, j just looking through the list here, um, I'll actually do it on, in uh, uh, event order. Saturday was the first day. I, I presented that day, so I was a little bit nervous. And so it's almost like the conference is kind of like a blur until you present. And then after you've presented, you actually get to enjoy the conference. Um, but uh, let's see here. TJ's talk uh, was really the first one I played you know, actual attention to on why did Neovim choose Lua? Um, and that made me feel like I should do some more Lua. I've, I've dabbled in Lua. Uh, I've had to write Lua stuff because of two programs. One is Hammerspoon, which is a great little Mac OS, basically gadget. It allows you to customize a bunch of stuff. Another one is IMAP filter, which allows you to run arbitrary logic written in Lua against an IMAP server. So you can do stuff that you can't usually do with email filtering rules. Um, and as far as Lua in NeoVim goes, I've only ever really used it to the extent that I've had to. So for example, customizing the, the LSP, for example. And uh, yes, yeah, just seeing TJ's talk made me kind of feel somewhat inspired to look at doing some porting of my plugins towards Lua, possibly, um, in the interest of making them go faster. Because the other way to make them go faster would be to switch to VimScript 9. But I'm kind of getting pretty darn tired of Bram putting incompatible features in, in Vim uh, as a result of similar analogs existing in NeoVim. So basically, you know, for years, Bram would ignore user requests and do whatever he felt like, which is fair enough because it's his project and he is the benevolent dictator for life. Uh, but it, it just was a pretty frustrating experience as a user to know that even if you would prepare a patch, that it might not be accepted. Um, and so... Neovim comes along and then, of course, a bunch of people start switching to it uh, because it gives them things they've wanted for a long time. And then only then does Bram decide to implement an equivalent, but he does it in a, in a unique way, for example, implementing functions with different names. And for me, VimScript 9 is just another example of this because if, he want, if the core problem he was trying to solve was making something faster than VimScript and moving past some of the idiosyncratic you know, like syntax issues that existed in VimScript, he could have just switched to Lua because it's already proven to work and there's already inertia and community behind it in the Vim space. But instead he decided to make a new language. So I'm, I'm starting to feel more and more like just moving towards Lua. Uh, then of course I gave my talk, um, which was an interesting experience. Uh, Partly because it's the first time I've done a virtual conference before. And unlike all the screencasts I do, it was live and it was using this platform called Hopin2. Uh, and the truth is that behind the scenes, it was like a fucking shit show. <laughs> because, you know, I had two computers. Uh, I was logged into Hopin2 in two places. Uh, and I had audio coming in from one ear from a Discord channel uh, where the speakers were. Uh, and then there was where I was presenting and then there was the what the audience was seeing. And depending on whether you were looking at the stage or the session, there was either a small amount of lag or a huge amount of lag. Um, and so basically you just had this chaos. You were trying to like monitor multiple chats. There was a backstage chat, a front stage chat, an event chat, um, the session chat. Um, and it's, it's kind of just amazing that anybody was able to present, I think, with just the constant bombardment uh, from multiple uh, places. But in the end, it kind of turned out okay. Um, and I've uploaded my talk to my YouTube channel. Uh, and then I basically just collapsed <laughs> after my talk and didn't really pay a huge amount. I was watching the sessions, but I, I didn't pay a huge amount of attention. Uh, Sunday, 
loved Oliver Caldwell's uh, chat. Um, first of all, because he's got an English accent, he just sounds intelligent just off the bat. But then you see, you see the stuff he's doing in the talk and there's no doubt that he's a clever guy. Uh, just seeing him use basically a Lisp dialect, uh, very closure-like, to not only build plugins, but also to configure Vim. So you look at his Vim dot files and they look like Emacs dot files, which is just kind of mind blowing. Um, and as I'm watching it, like I've never really dipped into Lisp very hard because my career is taking me more towards typed languages and Lisps are all about, you know, uh, code as data and there are no t- obvious explicit types, macros, it's all super, like super flex- flexible um, and it's hard for me to go there, but I, I can understand the appeal of that whole development workflow where you're just constantly evaluating your buffer or, or parts of it and just basically like clay, just like mutating the, the buffer until it does what you want. Uh, I think it's awesome and uh, really enjoy the talk. Uh, what's another one? Uh, David Beggin's talk on Vim as an instrument uh, was... Super interesting, like he's literally playing music with Vim. Um, he's a great presenter. I also tried to toggle between that and Ashkan's chat. Ashkan has a like a crazy complicated and customized Vim setup, which is awesome. Um, then I watched TJ's talk on the LSP. Uh, that was a great talk. Uh, I am super happy that the, the Neo Vim LSP is part of Core. I'm already enjoying it on my own setup. Uh, Maria's talk was unexpected. I thought she was going to be talking about what it was that made her jump from Vim to NeoVim in the technical sense. And uh, she shared some appalling pull request responses uh, or issues from Bran where he you know, shut down attempts to make the language in the Vim documentation more gender inclusive, just in the most tone deaf way. Um, and it's really sad because... I think Bram's a good person and, you know, this thing which he's always done about uh, trying to raise money for people in Uganda, uh, he obviously cares about people, but he's just blind to the the pain that people can experience as a result of this uh, language policy that he's got. Um, and, and just the response was just so, yeah, as I said, tone deaf. Um, it just really disappoints me, and I can I can see I don't want to make decisions about whether to use a technical solution based on politics, but just this in, these incidents were just so appalling that I can totally understand why a lot of people would, you know if they see this will just say like fuck Vim, why, why do I need Vim for anyway? Um, as I was saying before, uh, he's got this history of doing whatever he wants and only what he wants, and when he does it, he does it in a way that creates work for everybody who's trying to build things on top of the whole ecosystem. Because if you want your stuff to work for both NeoVim and Vim, you, you either have to have some kind of adapter layer or you have to do it twice. Which, it doesn't sound net beneficial. Um, and if you look at NeoVim's uh, trajectory over the years, it's a very respectful fork. It's not like an aggressive, like, fuck you kind of fork. It's a, a fork that's tried to carry forward improvements in Vim, you know, stay in sync. Um, and maintain respectful communication with the, the original project, um, maintain true to the spirit of him. I mean, it's just a good fork. Um, and at this point, it's got enough years of track record under its belt that I think you can safely say that like its future is probably brighter than Vim's future. Um, they're certainly not going to make any mistakes around inclusive language like Bram has made. Um, and there are multiple talented people involved. There's a critical mass there to keep it driving forward. I think the project has a bright future. And when I look at these two paths, like, you know, I want to make increasingly slick plugins in Vim, I can either write them in Vim script or I can write them in Lua. And I don't want to do it twice. And sure, maybe somebody's going to come along and write a transpiler. But like, unless it's basically free, I don't think I care as much as I used to about making my stuff work on both Vim and NeoVim. And um, then the last talk that I saw was a Brian Phelps talk. Um, I watched that one because uh, I'm super curious about OniVim in terms of its uh, Reason infrastructure that it's built in, because I love uh, the idea of Reason as a language. I've built little toy things in it. It's basically the exact opposite of Lisp, because it is uh, statically typed up the wazoo um, in a way that is quite 
alien if you're coming from another language, even a language like, say, a C or TypeScript, where you used to be able to kind of play a little bit, little bit loose uh, when you need to. Um, and so I don't see myself as using any of them because I, I have a very terminal-centric workflow, but the fact that the project exists, I think, is super exciting. It has this great licensing model in which you know, it's trying to be economically viable by charging people for licenses, but they've got this automated time-based open source re-licensing re re going on. Uh, so that after I think 18 months, all the commits that landed on the proprietary branch end up getting synced out into public. So that's great. Um, so those are my thoughts overall, I get about at the conference, uh, which is now finished, that all the people involved just worked so hard and I'm, I would like to thank them, even though I don't know if any of them will see this. Uh, but um, specifically and most obviously Adam, who was easy down here, uh, he really drove the organization of it all and the Primogen who poured his heart and soul into being the MC for the event. Um, just spectacular uh, and largely responsible, I think, for it all gelling together. And to everybody who presented, like they all worked super hard coming up with these great ideas and, and polishing them up and turning them into presentations. Uh, and then the people who attended, I didn't see any bad behavior. I just saw a bunch of like enthusiasts uh, reveling in the exploration of this space that we were all working in um, and trying to inspire one another and grow together. And it was basically probably, I mean, apart from the fact that it was artificial being in a virtual format, uh, it was definitely one of the most positive conference experiences I've had um, compared to others where they've tended to feel a little, little bit more like high school popularity contests with, you know, celebrities and cool kids and not cool kids and all that junk, which is just, boring so i would love to do it again um and i would probably love it even more if it was uh, in person next time but we'll see if that can happen but uh as i said uh, maybe by the time i publish this the videos won't have been uploaded to youtube but when they are uploaded i'll put some links in so that you can see the stuff that i've been referring to otherwise thanks for listening and we'll hopefully get back to some hands-on vim content next time <laughs>